reason, but generally speaking, 16% of U.S. households don't have a home computer of any kind, and that's essentially when you think about that. Uh, no laptop or even a handheld device. Uh, roughly a quarter of U.S. households still do not pay for internet uh, access, uh, and if you want to delve into that number, quite a few don't even meet the basic definition of broadband access. So now those who do internet, not everybody has broadband. Uh, for us, a lot of our computers go to students. Uh, one of our core programs we've been around, I'll talk about a little bit later, is called Cramden Tech Scholars. And that was the first program we ever launched back in 2003, and that was really to get free desktop computers into the hands of students uh, who did not have access to a working home computer and were in grades 3 to 12. Eighty percent of our student recipients who get a computer qualify for free and reduced lunch program. It's a pretty good barometer of the type of folks we're serving. Uh, it's become even more critical nowadays because 70% of teachers assign homework or classwork that requires access and access to an internet-ready device. Uh, well, a lot of housing authorities that we work with across the state with the adult population, but typically a family unit, and the family needs that for the children so they can do the homework and the classwork at home. I'm not going to go over too much detail, but it's it's who's getting left behind. The, the the first and the ones who are often the most forgotten all this is seniors. You know, they're constantly the largest block in terms of folks who are left behind the digital divide. The first thing thing about seniors is that the going those who have income and means to actually get internet access, internet devices and those who don't is enormous. So if you're a wealthier older adult you chances are you probably have multiple devices and you know how to use them versus folks on the lower end of the income spectrum do not. And that's the greatest gap. Uh, rest of the African Americans and Hispanics both lag behind both usage and connectivity. Uh, here in North Carolina, of the 45 reporting states, we're all number 40 at a, in terms of connected households. Obviously, there's some pretty good correlation between rates of digital speed and income and educational attainment. It, it, nothing here is earth shattering. Nothing is all that surprising. I mean, con considering who we serve consistently, we do this every single day. Uh, we offer kind of two sets of programs hardware and education. And I'll touch real quick about our hardware programs. Cramden Tech Scholars, I mentioned earlier, that's kind of our keystone program. That's the program that gets free desktop computers to students in grades 0 to 12 who don't have access to a working home computer and who are not paid by a teacher or educator. We take award anywhere between two and 3,000 free desktop computers every single year to students. Uh, and when free, I don't mean free to Cramden. I mean free to the recipient, to the student. Every computer, as I'm sure Casey and Dan will tell you, has a cost associated behind it. Uh, to rebuild the computer, to transport it, to maintain it, to install an operating system on it, to get it back to work in order. So there's a cost borne by these our nonprofits. For a lot of our recipients, we try to do our very best to either make it in mark free for Cramden Tech Scholars or very low cost for other nonprofits. Tech Community Partners, that's a very good uh, program. That's ones we typically use for public housing residents. If it, it, it comes to us, another nonprofit says, hey, we have some adult client here who don't fit into your Cramden Tech Scholars. We need a computer. They come to us and we subsidize the cost of that. The next equipment program, that's basically a nonprofit, charity, school, church, Anybody who's a 501c3 or a charitable organization in North Carolina, and typically beyond, if they just need computers, they tell us what they need, and we will design and build custom to what their desires are. And we really, really subsidize the cost of those. In Camden Computers, we have refurbished and awarded that number is a little bit low. It's actually over 32,000 now across the state since 2003. Uh, distributed in 83 of the 100 counties in North Carolina. Uh, computers donated to us by everybody. We have individuals who donate every single day coming through our front door, and then we have what we call our back door. So, so companies, organizations, uh, folks who really have a lot of computers to donate, and they come in through truck. Uh, computers, for the most part, are refurbished by volunteers. We can train anybody to refurbish a computer in less than 20 minutes. It's through production line, assembly line, uh, production style, and it, it turns out quite a few computers it's very easy to work on. A lot of companies love doing this for their volunteers and employees because it helps get them into community action and they can get to see the product that will work. Uh, our computers, the ones that go to our students, receive free tech support for as long as the students enrolled in school. 
and typically it's a pretty soft deadline. We've had people who are still way past school and they'll come back and they have a problem and we'll happily fix it for them. Uh, this is a quick picture of one of half of our warehouse. You can see the production line on the right. Uh, this is Lenovo. They were our founding sponsor. They happen to be here in the India area. Uh, go on. So the second set of programs, the one that's probably more of interest here, is our educational programs. We offer free literacy classes here at Cranston. And we this every Monday night uh, for anybody in the community who wants to come. If somebody has to, takes all four classes, they will then receive a free computer. So the carrot at the end of the stick. The other level, the one that's really the one that's aimed specifically at public housing authorities, is what we call their community access and education program. So what we'll work with a public housing authority. Either uh, we'll receive funding through contract or we'll receive funding through a grant. We will either teach, if it's locally here in the 16 county footprint of greater triangle area of North Carolina, we'll use our own staff to do it. But a lot of public authorities obviously are not in the triangle, they're in different cities across the state. So we have a trainer model where we will actually take a couple of public residents, they will come to Cramden, we will train them in our curriculum, our class material, they will go back to their, uh, to their communities with computers that we give them, and they will teach the classes themselves. So after four weeks, they will receive computers from us. And those trainers who are public housing residents themselves will get paid by Cramden as contractors. So there's an incentive there to kind of keep these classes going. And we've been, in some communities across the state, we've been doing this for over two years continuously. Uh, it's one of our most successful programs. Everybody feels incredibly confident when they leave our programming and they get to use their computer right off the bat. For our after school and camp programs and tech topics, these are classes and programs really aimed at underserved middle and high school kids who don't typically access to the sort of programming in their own communities. We're here at Cramden, and we also go abroad, uh, outside the Triangle to offer. Uh, this is one of the corporates I was talking about, the Fidelity employees, and you can see the production lines. They do all the work. We just make sure everything's uh, running in time, uh, and that's kind of where we are. So real quick, last thing we offer is corporate equipment services. This is one of the reasons, and I'm sure Dan and Casey will probably touch on it, but there's one limiting factor to all the work we can do is how many computers we can get. So we're kind of looking for more computers, and we offer full services to any company uh, in North Carolina and sometimes beyond where we'll come grab the equipment, we'll sanitize it, destroy it, uh, and we'll certify it. Uh, we'll responsibly recycle the e-waste. Uh, we events all the time, we have corporate events, volunteer events, recycle drives, scrap days. We go to military bases. Uh, so we like to be out in the community. Really how we, uh, the strength of this organization is based on our volunteers and community support we receive. So that, uh, hopefully I didn't go too fast. Uh, I'm looking forward to any questions and dialogue in, uh, at the very end. But thanks again. Great. We'll turn it over, and thanks, Michael. We'll turn it over to Casey. Thank you, Casey. Maybe on mute. Mute. I just started, so um, thank you, Michael, and thanks for the introduction here. There is some overlap between Cramden, Free Geek, and PCs for People. We all have a similar goal, but go about our work very differently. So we're excited to be here today to answer any questions and see how we can be helpful for housing authorities across the U.S. Michael, I come from a technology background, and we'll get into a little bit how we were able to leverage that to build PCs for people over the last 20 years. If anyone wants to get a hold of me, my email is first initial last name at pcsforpeople.org. So, C. Sorensen at pcsforpeople.org. We've been around for 20 years, but PCs for People, like many nonprofits, came from humble beginnings. There was a youth that had hacked into the computer system in his school in southern Minnesota and himself straight A's. And maybe he's gone for B's. But he got expelled and assigned to a social worker. And the social worker saw the strength, was able to get the boy a computer, 
and three months later, the boy had job programming web pages for churches in the early days of the internet. He works in the Twin Cities in a technology career, and transformation of one boy, a concept, was born in southern Minnesota. Get a computer into a home and see how that can transform the lives of the people that are surrounded by that computer. I had to go to school in that town and was able to volunteer refurbishing and distributing computers. After I went on to the corporate world, was lying out every Monday, back every Friday in technology automation, working with Deloitte, and started to reflect on what led me to that career track in IT, and decided it was when I was nine years old, and my mom saved for a full year and got me a home computer and a DOS for Dummies book. So I was a social worker and said, you know what, I want to give every nine-year-old boy, girl, anyone who wants a computer the same opportunity that I was lucky enough to have. He took me and said, well, there's no money in it, but if you want to, go ahead. So the eighth, I quit my consulting job and found 400 donated computers from corporations in the Twin Cities and lost PCs for people. And I thought it'd be set because 400 sounded like a lot. In the first three weeks without marketing or advertising, we opened our, we gave out a computer, and that person told their neighbor, mom, sister, look what I just got. And in three weeks, all 400 computers were gone, and you had a 1,200 family waiting list. So back, in that short time, we proved that if you can remove the cost barrier to technology, people will come and get it. They put it in their home. The major challenge we had is how do you remove the cost barrier, meet the unity need, and develop a sustainable program? program. And we did that through launching a service, like Michael mentioned, where instead of asking a company for a donation and getting 20 computers, we deliver an IT asset disposition service. So we're certified for data wiping, we're certified for recycling, and now of getting 20 computers, we get thousands of computers from corporations. 2010, we were able to eliminate our waiting list. Anyone who wanted a computer could come into our organization and get a computer. And there, we started getting feedback from people that the computer is great, but I'm having trouble keeping and maintaining a home internet connection. So we started looking into it and we were able to develop partnerships with Mobile Beacon and Mobile Medicine to become an ISP. So now we have the computers, and we also have a unlimited nationwide 10 a month LTE service. We're able to distribute hotspots with the computers. This to have the computer and internet in homes and focus on support. Three things we've been able to grow our impact, the chart on the right there, to now touch a quarter million people. And a joke, the person from Alaska found us last year, it's reached all 50 states and Puerto Rico. It's humble beginnings of one computer to a boy. Now we've been able to get computers in all 50 states utilized to do that has four pieces, refresh, distribute, and support. So we work with 700 businesses, like I mentioned. We've brought over 4.5 million pounds of electronics. And refurbishing a computer can be taught in about 20 minutes. It's a very systematic process. Once you learn, can be replicated. So we've been able to use our site in the massive amount of equipment that we have coming in to be a work training site for the local county, to pair with uh, colleges for internship programs, people doing both education but not hands-on. And we all work with organizations that do jobs for people with disabilities. So Warehouse now, we have over a dozen people in the autism spectrum that have never worked before that we're able to teach the technology skills of refurbishing and help place in the community in full-time jobs. Step of our model, we create value. Refurbishing piece, we had all these computers coming in, and we had to figure out how to quickly refurbish them. And they're coming from corporations. So if someone is going to go to the local big box store and buy the lowest cost computer they can, usually a little bit chintzy, it might be easy to break. But about working with corporations is it's enterprise tech. So it's four, maybe five years old hardware, and it's too old for the business, but is perfect for use, and it's good quality, and every computer we expect place expect to last at least three years in the home. We had all computer equipment coming in, 
and we need to get good at refurbishing it. I leverage the technology skills I have to create a system that's basically push button, wipe the data off, reset the computer with Windows 10 on it like new, and common user interface so we can have volunteers, our staff, interns produce a consistent product. And this before we've distributed a computer. The main point of, point of our program is distribution of computers. We do locally with offices in Minnesota and Colorado and online through our website. Ability criteria, no matter which way someone finds our organization, is 100% of the federal poverty level. Most people coming in produce section housing voucher, free lunch at school, food assistance, government program that's already vetted their income, work with nonprofits and housing authorities and libraries to place computers. The model uses a good, better, best. Someone into one of our stores, computers start at free. If you want it's a little faster, you can a little bit more money, which is about $35 per computer that we distribute. Many of them are distributed for free. The nationwide LTE network, this has been huge for the customers we work with. It's also portable. We partner with the large Comcast and other fixed ISPs. If someone has permanent housing, they know they're not going to move. Those can be great sources. One part about the internet that we offer is it is mobile. Mm -hmm. A lot of the customers we work with will have three or four different addresses over the course of a year. They get their laptop, they can take that spot and go to their next residence. Our digital inclusion programs focus on training up front. If you go through this course, you can get a computer. And that is great, but in doing our work, we decided to flip that. We wanted to get as many computers as possible into homes and then be able to support them. Once there's a problem, an issue, don't know what to do, they can call us for support. So right now we're effectively the help desk for 50,000 computers across the U.S. US. About 300 phone calls a day. We work with partners, we don't expect them to support the computers. We want to be there to support the residents and make sure the computers work. Quinty and do $25 repairs. Even if someone didn't get a computer from us, repair $25, his the goal is to keep working computers in a home. We do digital literacy and digital literacy training in our offices. Like working with housing authorities, we've worked with over a dozen housing authorities across the U.S. And we've usually had a conversation to determine needs and crafted a program to be able to make sure we meet those needs with the housing authority. So it mentioned to us that housing authorities a lot of times have difficulty finding quality computers in the quantities that are needed. And resourceful housing authorities have even come up with programs where they have third-party partners, source the computers, they pay that third party to refurbish. And after talking with those groups, I said, well, would it be helpful if we just had bulk computers at $55 a piece? And so we've done that program where we just ship bulk computers to Rhode Island, other housing authorities across the U.S., as many as are needed to do an event or distribute into the housing authority. We have mobile refurbing events, and these four-day events in a community where before we go, we're making calls and we're finding the equipment from local corporations. Day when we go, we pick up from the corporations. Day two, three, we refurbish. And four, we do digital inclusion training and distribution directly to the housing residents. We recently completed this in Austin, Texas and got 200 residents in the local housing authority computers. We've all had move-in packages where when move-in forms are filled out, some housing authorities have an option. Do you have a home computer? Do you have home internet? And the answer is no. A PCs for People computer is placed into the home when the family is moving in. On the slide there is my oversimplification, food, shelter, computer. Housing authorities work on the first two and PCs for People, or on the right-hand side, there's a refurbisher map there. After is a national organization of 90 refurbishers, like the refurbishers on this call. If you want to find a local refurbisher that can supply equipment in bulk, check out after.org. We have a partnership portal. 
So it's our sales portal and brands it for the housing authority or other nonprofit wants to work one on one with their constituents to take out the barrier of how do I order online? I've never done it before. I don't have a credit card. How can I place an order? It allows the housing authority to help guide people through that process. The ability to do in at checkout programs. And that portal has the technology where you can monitor devices, who has it, turn devices on, turn devices off. So done data reporting, where we have reporting agreements with housing authorities. Every of our customers has a brief survey they fill out when they get the computer and they renew their internet. So we'll provide data on number of people that have been impacted, interactions that are retained, what's the average income, have they ever owned a computer before. And that's my presentation, so I look forward to any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Casey. And so now we'll turn it over to Daniel. Daniel? Yeah. I'm humbled and privileged to work with people like Casey and Michael um, in this great effort to include everyone in the in career in consulting, much like Casey did, um, and did very well. And then I realized that it was doing very well for me. I wasn't doing very well for the world. And that's what drove me to Free Geek and what drove me to really being part of the whole digital inclusive <laughs> effort over the last couple of years. Um, Free Geek sustainably reuse technology, enable digital access, and provide education to community that enables people to realize their potential. Um, over the last uh, years that we've been in business, we processed about 1.5 million pounds of e-waste annually. Um, we do that re in a very responsible way with downstream refurbishment, just like Michael and Casey have, that are R2 certified or E certified. Uh, so that we know that things are not ending up in rivers and streams. Um, provide digital access by connecting our volunteers uh, as well as local nonprofits. We, we serve six to eight nonprofits every single week, providing them with all the technology that they need and the technology support that they need to serve their constituencies. Uh, we have a very strong program for K-12 uh, students where they, they could volunteer anywhere in the area, anywhere for anyone, and they will receive a computer from us. For, we have 73,000 pieces of technology out into the community since 2000 that we've been in business. Uh, we have free training on e-cycling, computer refurbishment. Um, we provide classes on everything from Based programming in Python to digital privacy, uh, about 6,000 long hours every single year. As you know, our programs, we do public and corporate e-cycling. E I'm not going to through all of this. I don't want to bore you. Uh, we do tech support. If you receive a computer from us, you have 12 months of free computer support. Uh, we do hardware grants to the nonprofits. We earn a computer program, which is really what we focus on for our housing authorities, where we go out, we provide through our strong partnerships, we provide um, daycare, we provide learning, as well as the devices that are necessary in order for people to get the online and, and get to use the the broadband and the internet that's available to them. Um, our I have three stories here that I wanted to tell. Uh, the first is Lenore. Lenore. Daniel, Daniel, sorry, this is Dina. I'm not sure that the slides are advancing. I was supposed to be advancing them for Oh, me. for you. Okay, sorry. Okay. Never mind. I apologize. Thank I'm on Geeks Impact. Yep. Awesome. So the first story I'd like to tell is Lenore. Um, Lenore volunteered her time at a senior facility 
in order to earn a computer for her family and her schoolwork. And she's thrilled to death. She said, I need the computer just for myself, but my family really needs it. And so she earned the computer that she did. You see a small grouping of women that are learning how to use the computer. The woman that's in the sand colored hajib, she, she learned the computer from us, and now she's a teacher. So she's become a teach the teacher, and she's doing one work out there in her housing authority teaching other women how to on the computer. These are people that, that Google's not a verb to them. They don't understand you know, the keyboard or the mouse. So we had to start with the very, very basics. Um, beneath the photo you see there is Jim. Uh, Jim has been volunteering with us since 2006 and provides Computer to people in China and people in Uganda. Um, he does all the refurbishment himself and just provides them out for free to others. Next slide: lessons learned. Um, we've learned more than anything else is that it takes a village to do this. Uh, partnerships that we have are strong and abiding. We have partnerships with our local library and with the Metro Center nearby us, uh, schoolers, uh, nursing students, um, as well as refurbishers that are assessed um, to provide the computers that these folks need. Um, one thing that we have is that every situation is different. Some people just need a basic computer in order to get on and do email. Other folks are really looking to enhance their graphics skills and have a job in the world of graphics. So we have to look at each individual and what do they need and provide that technology to them as they need it. Um, the most important things that both Casey and, and Michael have said, and I will, I will echo this as well, is that tech support is essential. Um, having that connection to someone that can help as things go wrong, as things will go wrong. These are complicated machines, um, but it is essential to long-term success. That's it for me. Thank you much, Daniel. Um, this is Dina, everybody. I'm the acting manager for uh, Connect Home. Um, I should have introduced myself at the very beginning. Um, but I want to really thank Michael, Casey, and Daniel for, for their great presentations and now open it up for questions from our audience. Um, feel free to type in in the chat box or um, and, uh, see that little icon kind of in the middle uh, of your screen on the, on the right-hand side of your screen. And we can unmute, unmute your phone. We'd love to make this a conversation, so please feel free to do that. Um, as we wait for questions, and I hope we get a lot, um, we, we have about 20 minutes. Um, I would like to ask our, our speakers uh, if they could shed some more light on um, other things that they've done with housing authorities. So in addition, like Michael, for example, in addition to helping with devices, are there other ways you've worked with PHAs? It's, you know, the device aspect is, I think all of us here, you know, Casey, Dan, myself, I mean, we see devices kind of part of this continuing spectrum of things you need to get somebody up and going in the 20th century in terms of digital connectivity, right? Be a digital native citizen. So for devices, we kind of carry. You know, we try to package them with digital literacy programming or other programming of some sort. So that for us, the device is just a means to an end. That's all it is. Um, you know, we try to make sure we obviously use devices that are enterprise grades. It's just it a while. For us, we want them to be used. We want them to be in the household, we want them to be used all the time to the point where you become almost invisible. You know, what are you doing in a computer? Well, I'm doing classwork, I'm looking for a job, I'm doing skills, et cetera. So first of all, we work with public housing authorities. It's really about using computers as a means of uplifting and getting program, uh, getting people to buy into what a computer can actually do for you. Um, because our big challenge really is Folks who want to take those classes, they'll come out and want 
and take the classes. That's not much of an issue. But there are some folks who don't see a need for it, and that's that, that's a very difficult educational process to tell them, look, it's not just for Facebook or games. I mean, you can do all the things with computers. In fact, you can have to do all those things with computers now. It's very few companies will take a resume in paper or a cover letter in paper. You know, uh, you can do a lot of skills training online. So it's complicating people and public housing authorities to say, yeah, you know, you need to do this not just for for the basics, but for everything else you need to, to uh, really a 21st century citizen. Thank you so much. Um, um, Any have anything to add, Casey or Daniel? I do. I think that everything starts with a device. Um, a lot of folks are worried about getting broadband, but broadband without a device doesn't really get you anywhere. Um, there is so much out there in the internet, and teaching folks how to get online and get uh, equipped. Whether that be learning or connecting to their schools, connecting to people that are, uh, lives that are, are back in, in whatever country or state that you came from um, is, is really key. So education and a device go hand in hand. Great. We have a question from Den the Denver Housing Authority from James Mabry, who is the Community Technology Coordinator. Do you have tablet options available for distribution to those in need of computer? And for people, we have them sometimes, but we don't get them as often just due to our source. We will get a couple hundred from a corporation, the primary desktops and laptops. And tablets definitely fulfill a need, but the feedback we still get from our custody if they're trying to do school, job searching, um, be prepared for a career where they have to use the technology that's going to be on the desk in the office that they would want to get a job. They're primarily looking for a Windows-based, not Linux, but a Windows-based laptop or desktop. Productivity. Right. I have Casey on that. Um, the tabs were almost a fad, and now we are we have a lot of tablets that are in because a lot of corporations have given them up in lieu of laptops and desktops, which are are much more productive. And, and I would add as well that it's you know we get them in, and to be honest, most of them we either refill for program support or we shred, unfortunately, because we can't. They're locked in some form or another. But the other problem is that it's really hard to refurbish a tablet. You know, by the time we get them, the batteries are not necessarily in great shape, and because everything's sealed, it's an inordinate amount of time. Uh, and we we see it as an enhancement. We don't see it as a productivity tool. So generally speaking, no. Uh, is that to say we never work with tablets? No, because again, if we get something that's relatively new, uh, we get a, a significant amount of them, and they all happen to meet our basic specs, then yeah, we'll find a special project for them. But we deal mostly uh, as Casey and Dan do in desktops and laptops. Thanks. Um, I have another question for you. Um, what are the most, uh, or sorry, what are some of the traits of your most successful partnerships? Say. Who wants? I, I'll, I'll volunteer, I guess. And this is Michael from uh, Cramden. So we were one of the original, uh, Durham happened to be picked as one of the original 28 Connect Home Cities uh, pilot program, or I guess the, I'm not quite sure, the pilot program when you have 28 count cities. Yes, that's maybe. right. <laughs> so we sec then Secretary Castro come down a couple of times. And I think one of the reasons it worked really well here is because to be as Cramden was here, we were offered to offer both literacy and devices, and a lot of the other connected home cities did not have necessarily those two things already up and running. Um, and the trend of the most successful, the fact that it, it happened very well and still rolls on pretty well, is that we have buy-in from leadership. And if you don't have buy-in from leadership, then it's not worth it. Um, we had, you know, the CEO of the public Durham Public Housing Authority here. He was in both feet. He would he put down to his staff said, "Look, look this is a priority." Um, we realize there's no federal fund behind it, but there's a lot of private partnerships uh, 
uh, and a lot of goodwill towards doing it. And that's kind of what we discovered is that, you know, we were able to offer devices and training, but there were a lot of ISPs here who were willing to go into public housing communities and wire them up for either free Internet service or incredibly reduced Internet service. Uh, we received grant funding from a lot of corporate uh, entities here to offer digital literacy training and to pay for the devices. So, you know, it, it, but I don't think that would have happened if the CEO of the Public Housing Authority wasn't so involved and, and the mayor as well. Um, you know, all the political, uh, all, all the elected officials were also in it. It kind of, you know, hit the phrase, but just think, you know, I mean, you need people to really kind of say, yeah, this is something we won't do. Um, not just because it's a fad or it's technology, but because it really is. I mean, the public housing residents, the whole point to get them temporary and to move on up to bigger and better things, you got digital literacy training and devices to do that. I mean, otherwise, how you can do workforce development and everything else that needs to be done nowadays. So I think everybody kind of saw the exact same goal at the end. And that's why it's worked so well here. I agree the same in Portland. We have a great partnership with Home Ford as well as our political um, mayor and the commissioners in Portland uh, supporting us and supporting this program. Um, it, it's, it also goes to diversity. Uh, one of the things that, that we've done a lot of work in with our technology partners is, is we want a diverse population that they can work with, but if you can't connect to the diversity, how are you going to get them involved? So I think recognition of that is also really important and has contributed towards the success of the program that we've had here. for people's side, it's been uh, when the housing already is engaged and committed to digital inclusion you, through specific programs that have been crafted and a digital inclusion manager that it's their responsibility to make sure there's some results for digital inclusion and be willing to have the conversations. I gave some tales of ways that we have worked with housing authorities and they've been crafted through conversations. So I'd encourage anyone who has a need, has an interest to, to reach out and see what can be done. Even if it's on the tablets, if there's a specific program that we want to distribute 100 tablets, let's have the conversation, whether through PCs for People, someone else on this call, or after through a local refurbisher. Everyone will be willing to help. The goals of the program is to get more devices into homes and craft a new program. We'll come on site, we'll refer you to another refurbisher, but it all starts with the conversation. Thanks, Katie. Actually, that, that was going to be one of my next questions is what, what's the best way for um, PHA that's never worked with a refurbisher to refurbisher or, and reach out to them? What kind of information should they share? Um, what's, is there a special jargon they should use? I mean, what, what tips would you have to, and, and this is the question for all of you, but you touched on it, Casey, so maybe you want to answer first. I don't know. Thanks. Uh, yeah, feedback would be have an idea of your program that you're looking to do. Are you doing digital inclusion training and this is a carrot? And we have gotten good feedback from housing authorities that when we were able to put this carrot out there that the number of people coming to these trainings increased, we helped meet our goals, and people or another refurbisher can help provide a great carrot to get, get, keep people engaged. So have an idea of your program and the expected volume. Are you looking for 20 computers one time? Are you looking for 200 one time? Or are you going to have a monthly program where you're going to slowly roll this out? You need it to be reoccurring. But have some of those ideas. And if you need devices, like I said, just the conversation, reach out. And every nonprofit that I've ever engaged with that's a nonprofit refresher has been more than willing to help. I see on that. This is Dan Bartholomew. Um, it all starts with a conversation. However, coming, coming forward with both the program that you, you like to see implemented, and we are willing to work with you to help meet that program, um, it also helps to understand your infrastructure. Do you have Wi-Fi available within your, your housing unit? Do you have a computer lab? Is there a library that you'd like to repurpose? Those kinds of questions, those kinds of answers that you come to the table with, with helps us help you. So the more that you know about your own infrastructure, the better we can help, help you. Thank you. 
Yeah, sorry, go ahead. I mean, it, not yeah, I mean, Casey and Dan did both on those have a pretty good idea of the scope, uh, the goal of the computer. You know, is it going to be digital inclusion? And when it comes to a whole lot of things, it's going to be just digital literacy, just devices. How do you have the goal or in terms of what kind of program you'd like to go up and running? But like Casey really said perfectly, and Dan too, it was flexible, you know. If someone wants to come with us and say, I want to try something new, hey, <laughs> we're happy to try new things. Uh, new things are great. Uh, we also are great at providing our basic services, but if there's, you know, for example, one public housing authority say, hey, we really want to do something with our uh, middle school kids, so let's come up with something. And we happen to do a lot of tech camps, you know, that technology camps and after school programs, so we were able to integrate some of that programming that we had in our pocket and our portfolio that we were able to roll out pretty quickly. Um, I guess, uh, hate to be the, kind of the uh, the flying human, but you know we're all nonprofits, uh, and public housing authorities are always relying on very, very uh, uh, resources. Not as written to me, resources are really late, but you know programs do cost money. They do funding and resources, so it's always something to keep in the back of the mind. Is when people think about these programs, also think about what resources are out there to actually fund them. Um, it's just it's the reality of the world. I hate, it, but it's the truth. That's a good point. Um, I don't see questions from our audience. Audience, please feel free to, to raise your hand or type in a, a question in the chat box. I'll give you a few moments to do that. Um, let's say I'm a housing authority in Texas. Could I work with one of your organizations since you are in Texas? Would, would that be possible? Would you recommend going through org um, to locate a, a more local referral. Focused on is making sure that we are conscious of the sustainability of what we do. So we do try to work locally as much as possible, but we leverage the national network of AFTER in order to serve all of us. Um, people have seen statistics up to 18% of America is not connected, 39% of rural America is not connected, so we're together to try and, and meet that gap as well. Um, but I would start with the after.org um, and see if we can get someone that's closer to you that could help you. Uh, you see it's for people, as Dan said, after would be a good start if you want to develop a local relationship. Uh, we also do freight across the U.S., so we'll ship one computer, one off, in UPS or 300 via a semi, and logistics to make sure they show up there, and we can help with the event or whatever the goal or program of the housing authority is. So we'll ship anywhere in the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico. Thank you. That's true for us as well. It uh, just depends on how much inventory people are looking for. If it's just devices, that's relatively easy, I think, for all three of us uh, organizations. Uh, the thing with After, uh, and you know, we're huge. Pro we're all I mean, on the phones. A huge proponent of After. The process right now of kind of trying to figure out, out which organizations can actually work, work just in their state. Or you know, a lot of organizations are very small. They're mom and pop shops, or sometimes run out of a church base. And we're actually trying to phone with a large organization. So we're trying to kind of put everybody into the right basket. So if somebody in Texas, and Texas is one of the few states that doesn't have an after member, I hate to say it, but, you know, it might have, it might be reaching out to one of the large organizations who can kind of cross state lines relatively easily. Um, you know, we're programs to be not just available, but also replicable in uh, other places with our trainer model, and that's worked pretty well. Uh, but, yeah, everybody on the call will work with anybody. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, Tina, it looks like uh, Jennifer Terry has raised her hand. Can you unmute her phone? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. I just wanted to make sure. Okay, so here's my question, and this is actually for all three of you gentlemen. Get most of the low-income Americans are living in private housing rather than in public housing. Have you all been involved in efforts with public housing authorities to provide similar services, aka devices in digital education? 
question to people in private housing. This is Dan. We that's actually the mainstay of our our assistance program is if we get to Free Geek, we can provide them with all the education they would pun or need in order to get online as well as with a little community service, twenty four hours of community service, they can they can all see the device. Um, that and the mainstay of our program. You have PCs for People, where if you go to our website, pcsforpeople.org, there's a buy online, which functions like any other e commerce site would. And we've gotten all 50 states in Puerto Rico as having that website where at checkout time it looks in the cart to see if anything requires eligibility. It's going to be our internet or any computer with Windows installed. And then you upload your proof of eligibility as you check out. But anyone that's low income can use that site. It doesn't have to be a housing authority. It doesn't have to be someone who's on government assistance. Hey, someone that can produce an IRS tax return meets the 200% poverty level. You know, public housing is a relatively late development for us. We've only been doing it for about four, four years or so. Most of our programs are originally aimed at private sector, you know, low income, anybody really. Uh, the majority of those aimed at low-income students. Uh, we were just intent on getting them computers into the house for free. Then have these other programs, similar to what Casey and Dan have, that if you know you still meet an income threshold, which us we just work through other nonprofits to get computers into their clientele's hands. Uh, so it's not necessarily possible for an individual to one can come out, hey, I need a computer. We will not work with them. We have to work with another nonprofit that can do that verification step. Uh, for us, just efficiency more than anything else. Um, I'm that does really work with students. Like I said, you know, if you're in grade three or twelve and a teacher nominates that student for a free computer, very awesome. We'll do it in a heartbeat. We do ask for free income verification or anything like that. I've always rather err on the side of more computers out in the community rather than fewer. Fear confirm. Have another two minutes if anybody wants to ask a question, raise your or types up in the chat box. Amanda Kojic. Um her question is HUD multifamily partners with private ownership entities um, received housing assistance. Do any refurbishers have experience partnering with a nonprofit um, nonprofit owners of housing, so receiving Section 8 assistance. So this is Dina. You may you may have this without realizing it. You know, because they're private owners, yeah. and you, um, so you it's very possible that you have. Mm -hmm. I have the question that was the owner of the housing complexes is a nonprofit, and have we worked with them? Yeah, basically the question. We have, and it hasn't been a lot different than any other nonprofit. Nonprofits are eligible for our computers and internet as well as the end individual. And sometimes when we've worked with nonprofits like that, we've been where the end individual is the recipient and filling out the paperwork, and sometimes it's been the actual nonprofit housing authority themselves. We have which are uh, reoccurring deliveries where every quarter there's 50 computers we just deliver. They're assigned to that nonprofit because they're eligible. They have their own programs crafted around it, where I distribute them or training or whatever they do. Thank you very much. Well, three o'clock, I want to thank our wonderful presenters today for presenting to us and also for the wonderful work you do in your community and across the country. As Dan said, it takes a village. I say that a lot, too, to do this work. And I also want to thank our um, audience, because I know you all are doing this work today. Thank you for your commitment to uh, public housing residents and helping to bridge the digital divide. Thank you to our TA provider, Enterprise, for helping us put this together today. If anybody has additional questions, um, you can feel, feel free to write to connect home, uh, connect home at hud.gov. 
and we'll be happy to follow up with any questions you might have after the session is over that might have dawned on you after, after it ended. Um, so thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you and hearing from you at our next webinar. Have a great day. Thank, thank you. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye.